OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Um, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And uh, I'd like to help answer some of the Webmaster web search-related questions that have been coming up over the past week or so. Uh, lots of questions were submitted already. So I'll try to go through some of those where I can. But if one of you wants to get started and ask the first question, feel free to jump on in. Hey, John. Uh, I'll take this occasion to ask the first question. Um, uh, this is a real canonical uh, issue I've been having. Uh, the website I told you about uh, in the medical niche. Uh, we've been using real canonical to uh, restrict Google from getting the filtered categories. So we just want to show the categories, not the categories with filters applied, because we already have landing pages for the most important filters. And we just don't don't feel the need uh, that we need to show every combination of filters. Uh, uh, we. Uh, so basically, this is the URL that's showing the issue. We applied uh, Rel Canonical for three months, I think it's now. And uh, so all these pages are still showing in the results. I also use Webmaster tools to actually block uh, Googlebot from, uh, um, I'm not sure what exactly it blocks. I guess it blocks indexing or crawling. Um, when you go to the filters part in Webmaster Tools, the path of URL parameters. The so URL parameters, yeah. Yeah, I, I block Googlebot uh, from the uh, that exact parameters the filters. And nothing changed. It's, it's still in the, I, I see there's no cached version, which I don't know if that means anything. But uh, basically, I don't think there's a need for those pages to exist in the index. Uh, some of this, uh, some of them actually just return one product uh, in a listing. So, uh, any idea why this wouldn't work? Might be something uh, on page related issue. So I guess there are two aspects there. On the one hand, we don't crawl all pages equally quickly or equally frequently. So some of them will crawl very often, every day or so, and others might be crawled every half year. So this is something that I think, from the first glance looking at this, I think these are essentially URLs that we crawl extremely rarely. So we, we know about them. We know that they exist. But we, we don't treat them as something extremely important, so we don't crawl them that frequently. And I think from that point of view, that's not something you'd have to worry about. The other aspect is that with the rel canonical, we still have to index that URL first before we can follow the rel canonical. Right. So what will happen is we'll index that URL, and we'll look, kind of go through the content, and then we'll follow the rel canonical. So there's always this period of time where we might have this other version indexed normally before we actually forward all of the signals to the canonical that you specify. And in both of those cases, that's not something I'd really worry about. Like uh, the query you gave me is a site query with the in URL part. And yeah. that's pretty artificial query. That's not something users would do. So what I imagine is if you search for some of those titles, you'll find the, the kind of the normal versions that we actually do index for your site. Uh, OK. Uh, and is there any uh, situations where Google might actually ignore rel canonical? I mean, other than you know, two rel canonicals on the same page or something like that? We, we try to follow it where we can, but we will ignore it for things like uh, when, you, when we see that it's completely incorrectly set up. So when we see that the whole, home, whole website has a rel canonical to the home page where clearly the webmaster did a mistake with copy and paste. And that's something where we'll say, well, we see this markup, but we're going to treat it as a signal. We're not going to treat it as a directive. And uh, we're probably going to ignore it in a case like that. But for the most part, if you use it within your website normally, then we'll definitely try to follow it. And we'll try to kind of keep those URLs from having, let's say, collected signals. Uh, we'll try to forward those signals to the, the canonical that you specify. But that doesn't mean that we'll drop that URL completely from the search results. 
So specifically, if you do a site query, if you do a complicated in URL query, you're very likely still to see those URLs because we, we know about them. We can see that you're trying to look for them. So we'll say, well, if he really wants to look for these URLs, we'll show them to them. And uh, that's probably to some extent what you're seeing. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Sure. All right, let's jump through some of the questions here. And if you guys have any comments or questions along the way, feel free to jump on in. Uh, well, I have a question. OK, go for it. Uh, Google changed uh, my title for mobile and uh, show different title on desktop search and on mobile search. Uh, shorter one on mobile. Uh, what's the best uh, recommended uh, uh, title for, uh, uh, let's say, a mobile friendly title for Google? Um, we kind of have to shorten them on mobile because we have less room. So that's probably what you're seeing there. And I guess the question is if you want to create short titles on your pages in general, or if it's OK the, the way that they kind of got shortened. Well, it's a, a generic uh, keyboard name like home for mobile. It's not something uh, that uh, feels relevant for the mo mobile user. OK, so like for the home page or? Yeah, it's for the home page. Yeah, that sounds like a bad, ex bad example. So yeah. if, you, if you want, feel free to post it in the chat, and I'll pass mm -hmm. it on to the team afterwards. Okay. Thank you. OK, here's a question about dot, 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 non dot, dot, dot. The data is shown for two sites is different in Webmaster Tools, I assume. But in essence, it's the same site. Why is the data not consolidated into one view? Uh, does this mean only part of the data is sent to analytics when connected? So in general, what, what happens with websites when you have different versions of your website with dot, 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 non dot, 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 or HTTP, non HTTP? HTTPS, I guess, um, is uh, we'll try to pick one of these versions as the canonical version, and we'll try to collect all of our signals, all of our data there. And usually that works out fairly well, even if the webmaster doesn't specify anything specific. And you'll find all of the data in Webmaster Tools in that specific version. If you don't see that we're picking the right version or that we're kind of uh, picking different versions depending on which URL you're crawling. You can also use uh, the rel canonical. You can use any of the other canonicalization methods to really let us know that this is the URL that you actually do want to have indexed. And uh, when you do that, over time, all of that data will be essentially shown in Webmaster Tools under that version that you specify. So essentially, over time, this should settle down into one of these versions. So you can primarily check that version. Until then, I just check both of these versions, or depending on how you have your website set up. Uh, this also affects sites that have a mobile version under a different subdomain, for example. Like uh, Some sites have it like m.example.com for the mobile version, and www.example.com for the desktop version. And for those sites as well, you need to kind of verify those versions in Webmaster Tools so that you have a complete set of the data. Um, at the moment, we're kind of treating this as a, as a technical separation. If you have different subdomains, those are essentially different sites. Um, if you use different protocols, those are essentially technically different sites. And theoretically, you could have different content on them. That's why we kind of collect this data separately. And we've seen in the past, for example, some e-commerce sites explicitly do that that they put some of their content on the HTTP version and some other parts of the content on HTTPS. And if that content is clearly separated, then we need to track that data separately. Um, I imagine over time, in the long run, we'll find a way to kind of consolidate all of this information into one website view, but I don't see that coming anytime soon. So. In the meantime, you're going to have to kind of get used to looking at these different versions, make sure you're checking them appropriately, also making sure you're doing the right settings in the version that's actually canonical. So if you, for example, set your geo-targeting in the dub, dub, dub version, but we're actually indexing the non-dub, dub, dub version, 
then we might not be using your geotargeting setting. So that's something you really need to make sure that the settings you give us are actually in the version that we're actually indexing. All right. Uh, what I do when a site won't even rank for its own domain name, even after it's been optimized over and over again and never received a penalty? Um, this is, I guess, always a tough situation. Usually, this happens if there are really, really strong signals on our side that are saying that we can't trust this website really at all. Uh, that's something where maybe the quality, from the quality point of view, there's something really problematic here. Maybe there is something from a web spam point of view that's really problematic with this website. Um, sometimes we also see this question when you have a very generic domain name. Uh, for example, if you call your your website, I don't know, uh, cheaploans.com, and you expect to rank for the query cheap loans, then that's not automatically going to happen. So just because it's your domain name doesn't mean we're going to rank your site for that. So on the one hand, really make sure that you have everything covered from top to bottom, that uh, things are actually working as they sh sh could be working. And then make sure you, that you're looking at it realistically, that your domain name isn't something that's so generic that we just have so many other options to show in the search results that uh, we might not even get to yours if your site is fairly new, for example, or if it hasn't built up a really strong reputation over time. Um, choosing, changing URL structure from category to flat, does that matter for SEO? For example, root domain.com slash category A, category B, page URL.html to root domain.com slash page URL HTML directly. Um, I've noticed some sites uh, using exactly the same URL structure. Uh, it's something where I, I think there are multiple aspects to this. Uh, on the one hand, it's important to make sure that uh, you're giving us something that has like a unique URL structure in there. So when we crawl those pages, we can look at those URLs and we can say this is really a unique identifier for those URLs. This is something we sometimes see as problematic for sites that rewrite their URLs. They internally have a URL structure that works with IDs or with names. And uh, internally, it works with URL parameters, for example. But that's kind of rewritten in a way that it makes it look like there's actually a physical directory structure there. And a lot of times, we'll see that people do this rewriting in a way that's suboptimal, in that there are multiple or almost infinite number of combinations that lead to the same content where maybe you can switch like the different parts of the path around, or maybe the whole path is irrelevant, and actually there's an ID way at the end that actually specifies what the page is. Um, upper lower case might be totally irrelevant. And in cases like that, we might crawl a lot of variations and all come up to the same content. So that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at your URL structure. Uh, when you're comparing things like a flat URL structure to a folder-based URL structure, in general, that's not something I'd worry about. That's essentially equivalent from our point of view. Uh, sometimes it's easier to work with a flat structure. Sometimes it's easier to work with a structure that has separate folders. So that's essentially something we leave up to you. Uh, quick follow-up on that, John. Um, so uh, does real canonical usually help? This, uh, these situations where, uh, uh, let's say, a product page that's both through uh, URLs based on what category is it accessed from, uh, does that usually help? And uh, um, I've noticed some CMSs, uh, for example, uh, as I said, you can access the product through multiple categories. It generates uh, multiple URLs. It does have a role canonical with, that, with the categories removed, so it's just domain.com slash product.html. But that URL isn't actually accessible from anywhere through the website other than that URL canonical. So you can't act really access it directly. You can just uh, get rid of a URL canonical. Would that be an issue for uh, Google? So on, on the one hand, with the URL canonical, one thing to keep in mind is we still have to recrawl all of these pages to find the URL canonical. So it's not like a redirect that leads us directly to the final page. So if you're 
limited from your server server capacity that you don't want Googlebot to crawl unnecessarily, then maybe a redirect is, is better there. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a limited number of combinations that lead to the same page, then that might not be that problematic. So if you have, I don't know, let's say four or five different category combinations that all lead to the same product, and it has a rel canonical to the product URL, then those five times are probably not going to cause problems on your server. On the other hand, if you have an infinite number of combinations that all lead to the same product URL, then that could potentially cause problems. So in the past, for example, we've seen things like session IDs in the path. So you have like product name, and then a session ID, and then the actual product ID. And those are the kind of things where we almost have to crawl an infinite number of URLs to even notice that there's a problem here. So that's something to really watch out for. But if you have a limited number of categories and they all lead to the same product, that's not something I And is it an issue that the, uh, the, the real canonical target isn't actually uh, accessible through the website the structure itself? Is it just there from the real canonical target? Uh, in general, that's not a problem. Sometimes what will happen is we have almost like a mixed set of signals that we see all of the links point to one URL, and that URL has a rel canonical pointing at a different URL that has no links. And then we kind of have this mixed bag of signals where we say, well, everything is pointing at this URL that this is actually the one you want indexed, but that one's saying you actually want a different one indexed. So that's the kind of situation where our algorithms will have to make some kind of a judgment call. And it's not 100% certain that we'll always follow the rel canonical in a case like that. Uh, we'll try. But uh, if it's really the case that none of the links point to the actual page, then that's something where I wouldn't guarantee that we'd always pick that page. Oh, OK. Because uh, Magento actually uses this uh, uh, type of structure. So I was always curious when I'm analyzing a Magento website if that was the well, obviously, it's not the optimal way, uh, but yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, but I, I think it's also important to keep in mind that if we have different pages that show the same content, then it's essentially irrelevant for the webmaster which one we actually show as a canonical. So we might show this one as a canonical uh, because it's it's a nicer URL, maybe, or it's the one that you have the rel canonical pointing to, or we might pick a different one as canonical because all the links point to that version. But the page is going to rank exactly the same, like the content there. So it's not the case that the website would have any disadvantage if we chose this one or that one. Well, I know there's no duplicate content penalty of any sort, but isn't it, I don't know, more optimal to have a limited set of URLs in the Google index that all have the best uh, content? The, the website. Yeah. I mean, that's that's always a good idea, I think. Um, but it doesn't really matter which one we actually pick for that. So if you have one URL in a category, or you have the other URL directly with the product name, then if we pick one or the other, it's still one URL. And it's, it's one that we show in the search results. So it's not something where I'd say this is a critical problem that the webmaster has to fix. It's kind of. The webmaster is giving us uh, their preference, but we're ignoring their preference. So maybe the webmaster says, oh, but I really, really want this URL index because I like it a lot better. Then they need to give us more signals to kind of support that decision. OK, so Google basically makes uh, a decision based on all the signals that it gets and tries to re retrieve the best option for the person yeah. where. Uh, OK, and one quick uh, question. Uh, uh, you told me you said that uh, Google doesn't actually guide itself based on the URL structure to understand how the, for example, how the product fits into what category and such. Um, is there a difference when using uh, uh, structured data or breadcrumbs? Because it, there is a difference when showing the snippet. Uh, is there a difference in how Google understands where the product fits in what categories, relevancy, and such? Um, I'd say we don't necessarily do that based on the URL alone, but we do see that when we crawl the website. When we see this is a category page and it links to this set of products, that's, that really helps us understand the context of those pages. And that's something that is usually also reflected in the rich snippets. 
but primarily we'd see that uh, through crawling the website and seeing how it's kind of connected. So the breadcrumb structured data is some sort of a, a signal that helps Google understand better, or it doesn't matter? Um, I think we mostly just use that for the, the snippet in the search results. Uh -huh. So for displaying the URL a little bit nicer. Um, with breadcrumb markup specifically, you just need to make sure that you're using the markup that we have in the help center, not the schema.org markup, because the schema.org markup doesn't work yet. Yeah. OK, thanks. All right, let's grab some more questions here. Hi, John. Um, I was wondering if I could jump in with a question, if that's sure. OK. Sure. Oh, thank you so much. OK, so I posted this to the q and I'll just read it real quick. Uh, my question is, is there an algorithmic component to Penguin? And how easy is it for a bad player, such as a spam bot, to negatively affect my domain with a bunch of malicious do-follow links? Uh, reason I ask is because I found that I have over 25,000 do follow links to one page on my site which have spiked up in the last 60 days or so and it's appearing on thousands of hacked forums uh, inside a spam post and I tried to disavow about 500 domains as a result of this but I'm I'm kind of unfamiliar with what can be done or any thoughts you have on all this mm -hmm. Um, so Penguin is essentially completely algorithmic. It's not something where we manually go through and kind of uh, sort those out. And uh, we do look at web spam signals when it comes to Penguin. So things like really spammy links would be included there in general. Um, in, oops. Something's ringing. OK. Hold on. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I don't know if that's even on my side. OK, we'll just ignore it for the moment. Um, so in general, we, we take into account those, those kind of things in our algorithms. Um, in practice, however, we, we have a pretty strong protection against like this generic type of hack content, this generic kind of auto-generated spam. And uh, that's not something where I'd say we, we see that as a big problem. If you do see this happening, then I think putting it in your disavow file is a great idea because it kind of takes the problem out of the world and it's something you don't have to worry about anymore when you do that. So I'd say for the most part, we catch these things automatically and you don't really have to worry about them. If you do see them, taking care of them yourself kind of eases the load on your, on your side and make sure that we actually do uh, ignore them. OK, I appreciate the feedback on that. Thank you. Uh, because we're definitely not what I would call an SEO expert. We've been running our site for almost 10 years. And mm -hmm. this year is the first time I've, I'm finding we have experienced a negative decline in traffic around the same time that people are reporting these algorithmic updates. So um, maybe it is Panda, too. I'm not sure yet. We're still in the process of, of trying to figure all that out. So thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely take a look at the, the dates to see what when you're seeing these changes. It might also be that you're just like seeing kind of like a, a subtle decline, which is just our algorithms in general maybe not being as happy as they used to be with your website in general. And those are the kind of things that are almost harder to resolve as a webmaster because there's no line in your HTML that you have to fix there. There's no disavow that you have to add there. You really have to kind of take a step back, look at your website overall, and think about what you could be doing in general to significantly like take it a step further from when it comes to quality, when it comes to, to the website itself. That makes sense. We have been spending a lot of time sort of relooking at everything. So uh, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. And I think one thing just to keep in mind that uh, these changes don't take effect immediately. So if you make bigger changes on your website when it comes to quality, if you do these disavows, then that's not something where you'd see an immediate change. Sometimes it really takes several months for that to kind of bubble down in our algorithms. And uh, specifically with regards to something like the Penguin algorithm, that's not run that frequently. So that might take a while for it to actually be reflected. OK, sounds good. All right. Uh, will there be advice in Webmaster Tools if a site is hit by an algorithm? Would be a nice and helpful feature. I've heard this a few times, yes. Uh, we do talk about this with the Webmaster Tools team and with the search quality teams that work on the algorithms. 
Um, I think it would be nice to have some more information like this in Webmaster Tools, but I don't see that happening in, in the near run. So maybe in the long term at some point, but definitely not, not really soon. Uh, it's really tricky with a lot of the algorithmic information that we have because the algorithms are essentially built to provide relevant search results. They're not built in a way that you could take this information one-to-one -one and give it to the webmaster, and the webmaster would have something to work on. It's essentially we're trying to bring the best search results, and sometimes that maps to something that the webmaster can do directly, but a lot of times it's just uh, a change in the web, a change in how we think relevance should be handled, and that's not something that we can really tell the webmaster and say, hey, by the way, something changed on the web or something changed in our overall systems, and maybe you could do something on your website, but we don't really know what to tell you. So these changes happen all the time, and it's not always the case that there's really a one-to-one -one relationship between changes in our algorithm and something that the webmaster could specifically do to kind of bump their site back up to number one where it used to be. Uh, uh, if I can give something back, what would actually be helpful is uh, telling the webmaster that he's kind of closing in on some of those uh, uh, spam issues, especially. So uh, usually when there's a negative sign that something the website is doing isn't in agreement with the Google guidelines, that would even that would be enough. Uh, to, yeah. The, the webmaster is something that the webmaster can actually uh, take control of, especially exactly. on the website. Yeah, I, I think some of our algorithms might might uh, fall into that category a little bit more, where we'd say maybe like. I don't know, the overall view of, her, of the quality of your website has gone down. That might be something the webmaster could take action on. Or if we had an algorithm that looks at keyword stuffing and says, oh, we're seeing a lot more keyword stuffing on your pages, you should kind of you know, hold yourself back a little bit. That might be something that the webmaster could work on. But uh, a lot of our bigger algorithms really look at kind of a, a whole combination of signals. And it's not something where we could say, this algorithm says your site went down a little bit, therefore you need to do this specifically. It's a uh, it's really hard problem. But I think, to some extent, some of this uh, is kind of a logical progression of what we've done with uh, the manual actions, with the web spam issues, which we have brought up in Webmaster Tools now. And I wouldn't say it will never happen, but I don't see this as something that's trivial where we'll just, oh, yes, we'll just add this feature to Webmaster Tools, and it'll be really useful. It's There's a lot of work that need, would need to be done before we could get to that point. Yeah, right. OK. Which ranking factors or metrics are most important for SEO and Google? Which ones, uh, which of those should we more focus on? This is a tricky question. Um, from my point of view, I kind of split this into two things. On the one hand, I think from a technical point of view, there is a lot of work that kind of needs to be done as a, as a foundation. And that comes to understanding how crawling and indexing works, understanding how your server responds, uh, how your server, what kind of capabilities your server has, how fast we can crawl it, how many URLs we can find from your server, how we can crawl your website in a way that it doesn't end up in infinite space, an infinite number of URLs, and how we can actually index your content. Uh, sometimes we'll see websites that use one URL for the whole website. They have a fancy JavaScript app or a Flash app, and the whole website is one single URL, and that's not something we can index. We don't have different URLs that we can focus on. So I think from a technical point of view, there is this foundation that you have to build on, and I think that's a large part of SEO that uh, that is really critical to a website. Um, for a lot of websites that are using existing CMSs, some of this is probably already covered. So it's not that you explicitly need to work on this, but uh, sometimes it's already provided by default with a generic installation of WordPress or whatever you're working on. Um, other factors past that, when people talk about like their keywords and titles or keywords and headings and all of those things, I see that more as something almost indirect in the sense that 
If you have a really great website on top of being crawlable and indexable, then these are things that our algorithms should be picking up on automatically. It's not something where you artificially need to be adding your keywords into specific places or building links with specific keywords to kind of get that uh, thing uh, indexed or kind of picked up in rankings properly. In the long run, if you work on creating a really fantastic website, then that's something our algorithms will try to pick up on from, from various angles. So um, from my point of view, I like to just say you need to, you definitely need to have this technical foundation in place. And that's a large part of SEO. That's a large part of the things that many websites do wrong. Even really big websites get that wrong. And on top of that, you really need to make sure that your website is absolutely fantastic. So instead of focusing on keywords, really make sure that you're covering everything for the users instead. But uh, I, know, I know people want a list of individual factors, like where you need to put your keyword in the URLs or in titles or in headings or which meta tags you need there. But I think those are all really short-sighted metrics, where if you focus on putting your keywords into the titles and you have a really mediocre website, then in the long run, that's not going to work out. That's something our algorithms are either going to pick up on right away or pick up on in the long run. John, just give me the exact keyword density number. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah we tried right? that once. We, we made wow. a joke in one of these Hangouts and said, you need to get this keyword density. And someone didn't realize that we were making jokes. So I'm going to refrain from making jokes like that. OK. Hey, uh, uh, I have a question about um, uh, diversity in uh, content. So uh, for a while, differentiation and, or diversity in content has been a significant uh, factor because you know, no one wants to look at the search results and see all the same kind of content there. And uh, But in relation to uh, platforms that are used by many different people, uh, e-commerce, for example, I'm curious about uh, how deep uh, that would go. And uh, because, I mean, even if uh, the search algorithm is only looking at, um, you know, the, the visible content rather than, you know, uh, layouts and coding formats, et cetera, uh, all of those things uh, accumulatively on certain platforms uh, do come together to provide uh, a lot of sameness, uh, especially in the area of something like uh, e-commerce. So what I've seen in uh, a project that I'm working on now, uh, like one particular e-commerce platform, that's a software as a service type of platform, so it's all online. It means you have to build, either use their templates or build with what they have. So uh, even if you're uh, customizing, uh, m for the most part, people use uh, either scripts on their server uh, are, are required to, or uh, you know, fonts and CSS, everything that's on that particular type of server. So I've had uh, concerns about uh, some of these um, in the e-commerce arena not providing enough uh, differences. And, and so this particular project that I was working on, I did some research of ranking uh, of all of the, like the 100 top sites in that area, and then looked at all of the uh, platforms that they were using. And you know, uh, sure enough, I did find that this particular one that was a software as a service uh, that always had links back to the servers and, and uh, had a lot of similarity. Uh, none of those appeared in the top rankings for these, uh, you know, even in the top 100 of this area. And it's, it's a popular service, like in the top 1% of e-commerce. But then another one, which is even more popular, which is like the top 10%, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, Magento, for example, uh, but you can download it or they have enterprise editions, etc. So you get a lot of versatility when you download it and you can uh, program it and set it all up exactly the way you want. So there's a lot of more room for customization. That particular platform, I see, you know, taking up a third of the results. So uh, does does that make sense here, or do you think I'm I'm just uh, looking, uh, you know, that there's not enough correlation there that I'm missing the wrong things? Yeah. Because uh, uh, with the, you know a particular platform that uses a lot of the same type of content like that? I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. I think you might just be seeing more like like these kind of uh, secondary effects there, but that's something where we wouldn't be looking at it from that point of view and say this looks different, therefore it's, it's better than another site. We're essentially looking at these sites overall and if this is a reasonable platform, if it works well for users, and users are happy with that layout, then I think that's completely fine. That's not something where I'd artificially change like the, the CSS or the UI to be unique just for the sake of uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And so even if uh, it referenced all of the uh, 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 scripts and and fonts and everything within the same platform. Um, that's, you don't no, see that that's, that's, that might be a particular issue. I I wouldn't worry about that. That shouldn't be a problem. All right. Uh, well, I guess then the uh, the other things that would provide more uniqueness there then may play a more uh, important role. Those the people that are running a, a unique platform like that would also tend to be the people who would know more about uh, how to customize and create yeah. uh, really unique content. I I imagine that's partially the the case, but also the case that uh, the people who have the knowledge to keep it a platform like that running on their own, they, they have a lot of experience with, with e-commerce, and maybe they have a lot of experience working with users and know which, which type of interactions make sense, which type really works well. And I wouldn't necessarily assume that if you're using a default installation with even a default theme, that the theme itself is something that's going to cause SEO problems. That's more something that, that users would see and that they might react to differently, where they say, oh, this looks like, I don't know, a generic Canadian pharmacy site because all the spammers use the same theme as this legitimate e-commerce site, then that could be a problem. But it's not the case that our algorithms would look at that and say, well, this is a generic theme like all other e-commerce sites that would that we treat this as kind of lower quality or bad. I mean, you can see the same with blogs, for example, or with uh, default CMS setups, where there are a lot of really good blogs on a default WordPress installation, and mm -hmm. they, they rank fine. It's not the case that you need to have a unique UI there if you're focusing on like the textual information that you're giving to, to users. OK. Yeah, so that does the, the secondary effects then could be. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's something if users feel confused about your website, that's that's something where they might not recommend it as, as much, where they might not uh, kind of pass that on to other people. They might not go there. They might not search for it directly over time. Mm -hmm. All of these kind of secondary things where if you're not making your users happy, then they'll go somewhere else. Right. All right, thanks. All right, uh, we use Discuss for user comments. Currently, Google can't see the comments due to JavaScript. Should we reconfigure so that Google can see the comments? Are user comments considered good content? Uh, should we be worried that comments can dilute the quality of our good content? So there are lots of good questions in this one question. Um, on the one hand, when it comes to being able to see that content, we're getting better and better at understanding JavaScript. So I check the Fetches Google rendered view 
in Webmaster Tools to see how much of it we're actually picking up on. Maybe we can actually read these comments directly in the meantime. And uh, that might solve that problem, or at least answer that part of the question. Another thing, I believe, which is also with discussed comments, is that you can add a plugin to your website that will add those comments directly into your HTML so that all search engines can see it, even those that don't access the JavaScript version. So that might be another option to kind of get those comments included into your website. Uh, with regards to whether or not you'd actually want to do that, that's, I guess, a totally different question. And that's something where we essentially try to treat these comments as part of your content. So if these comments bring useful information in addition to the content that you've provided also on these pages, then that could be a really good addition to your website. It could really kind of increase the value of your website overall. Uh, if the comments show that there's a really engaged community behind there that encourages new users when they go to these pages to also comment, to go back directly to these pages, to recommend these pages to their friends, that could also be a really good thing. On the other hand, if you have comments on your site and you just let them run wild, you don't moderate them, uh, they're filled with spammers or with people who are kind of just abusing each other for, for no good reason, then that's something that might kind of pull down the overall quality of your website, where users, when they go to those pages, might say, well, there's some good content on top here, but this whole bottom part of the page, this is really trash. I don't want to kind of be involved with a website that actively encourages this kind of behavior or that actively kind of promotes this kind of content. And that's something where we might see that on a site level as well. When our quality algorithms go to your website and they see that there's some good content here on this page, but there's some really bad or kind of low quality content on the bottom part of the page, then we kind of have to make a judgment call on these pages themselves and say, well, some good, some bad. Is it like overwhelmingly bad or is this overwhelmingly good? Where do we draw the line? And we do that across the whole website to kind of figure out where we see the quality of this website. And that's something that could definitely be affecting your website uh, overall in the search results. So if you really work to make sure that these comments are really high quality content, that they bring value, engagement into your pages, then that's fantastic. That's something that I think you should definitely make it so that search engines can pick that up on. Uh, if, on the other hand, these comments are kind of low quality, unmoderated spam or abusive comments just going back and forth, then that might be something you'd want to block. Maybe it's even worth uh, adding moderation to those comment widgets and kind of making sure that those kind of comments don't even get associated with your website in the first place. Uh, removing backlinks from cloud tools is a very long and frustrating process. What can we do about it? Um, I, I think a, a snarky answer would be not to build these kind of spammy backlinks in the first case. But uh, I know a lot of you are stuck with a website that someone else has uh, kind of promoted in the past, and you work on cleaning these things up. And I know this is uh, sometimes a, a a bit of a problem to kind of get all those links, compile them, go through them manually, figure out which ones are really spammy, figure out which ones are, are actually really good ones that you definitely want to keep. Um, my recommendation there is to work with something like a spreadsheet and kind of go through them individually. If you use something like Google Docs, you can share that work with other people as well. You can get advice from the community and kind of say, hey, this is what I think I should submit my disavow. Do you agree? Do you not agree? Or these are the links I want to keep. These are the links I think are really spammy. Can you help me find a solution there? And usually when you work like that, it's it's definitely a timely, a time-consuming process, but uh, it's it's something that's doable. I know there are also third-party tools that help you with that, that kind of try to pre-filter those uh, links that you have, and that might be a solution as well, depending on how big your website is, how much you actually have to work to clean this up.
Uh, if you're a new startup website and a new domain in a segment where there are already lots of high-quality, high-ranking sites, what's the best strategy? Uh, would you focus on niche articles for long-tail keywords first? I think I, I would treat this like any business uh, situation where you're going into an established market and think about what you can do to be unique. And instead of competing one-to-one -one with all of these established websites, maybe you can find a niche that uh, is something that the other people aren't focusing on yet and kind of uh, go through the back door. So I don't think there is any SEO trick to ranking a new website in a very well-established market, just like there isn't any business trick that would uh, kind of drive business to your business if there's already a very well-established competition in the same area. John, can I just go back to the question about uh, the spammy links? Sure. Sure. Um, so I work for an email service provider, and we, uh, what our app basically does is we have a plugin where uh, our clients can basically subscribe to it, and you know we obviously have a, a link going back to our site for that. Um, would you treat that as spammy links as well? I've just placed it in the Q and in the group chat as well. There. Okay, and what I mean, or, or so how this do is these links get forwarded, or how how does that happen? So this is basically a subscribe form, right, from a customer, but it's linked to our app. And uh, obviously the app is hosted by us, so automatically these URLs um, get created, these strings get created through our app. Um, and it comes back as backlinks. So would you say that's spammy? Because I remember in a previous Hangout that you had about someone to discuss, someone asked about a WordPress plugin and they had backlinks in there and you said that's not a good idea so would you say this is a good idea or not? Should we just add no follows on these? I'd, I, I guess I, I'd, I'd add no follow just to be on the safe side here. Yeah. I don't know exactly how you how you do this at the moment So because it looks like there's sure. JavaScript behind it it is. So I don't know if there's even like a direct link there, or is this an iframe that other people would embed? It's basically a, a JavaScript that's pushing through, yes. Yeah. So I mean, if this is just JavaScript that's doing something, then I wouldn't necessarily see that as something problematic. Okay. Because it's not something we, we, that we pick up on as a real link that would be passing page rank. Sure. But if you had like a link on the bottom, I, I guess the, the extreme case is one where the link is totally unrelated to the service, where you have, I don't know, cheap casinos link on the bottom of your yes. email form, then that would definitely be a problem. Uh, if you have a link back to your service, that's something that, depending on, on how you present this, could be completely fine. It could be So in other words, powered by our company, that would be fine. Yeah. That, I, I wouldn't necessarily worry about. Yeah. Okay. And then one last question, if you don't mind, um, with regards to href lang. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, sorry, I did post in the Q&A, but I'll ask it anyway. I updated my href lang tags on the 28th of um, November, mm -hmm. and uh, our CMS that we were using was basically pushing out incorrect ones, like, for example, cn hyphen cn, which is supposed to be zh hyphen cn. So, yeah, that was updated on the 28th. Um, I looked in my webmaster tools two or three days ago, and um, I, sh I saw that the data was refreshed on the second, but it's still showing the old um, tags, if you want to call it. Yeah. It hasn't updated to the new tags yet. So we have to recrawl those pages before we can actually reprocess those tags. So okay. I imagine this is something where over the next couple of weeks, you'll see kind of a gradual change in those graphs. Okay. And that's that's essentially what you'd be looking for. You wouldn't see a jump from one day to the next. Of course, yes. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Uh, why is Penguin still rolling out? Um, I don't know exactly why. I, I know the, the engineers are working on this, so this is something that's essentially still happening. I had assumed that this was uh, complete a little bit earlier, but uh, I guess it's still happening. Um, let's click that one. Um, 
There's a startup question again. So if you're a startup, should you focus on smaller number of pages or a higher number of pages? Uh, in general, I probably try to focus on a smaller number of pages and make sure that they're absolutely great instead of a high quantity of pages that are kind of mediocre or even lower quality or that might be auto-generated. Uh, I'd really make sure that you have something that you can present that really kind of shines, that shows the unique value of your new business. Um, how will a website be affected because it's using tabs? And what's the best solution for the user and the webmaster? I'm using tabs because of mobile usability. Um, in general, this isn't something that's new. It's essentially the way we've handled hidden content for a long time. So this, kit, this question kind of refers to uh, a comment I made in one of the previous Hangouts where we said that hidden content, even if it's hidden behind tabs or if it's behind like click to expand sections, that we kind of discount that kind of content. And that's been the case for a number of years now. So that's not necessarily new, and it's not that websites that are using tabs would suddenly see a drop in rankings because of that. Um, if you're using is for usability and this is content that's secondary to those pages, that's absolutely fine. If this is the primary content of your page and you're placing it behind tabs, then that's something where I might create separate pages or bring that content into the visual part of the page so that we can actually treat it with uh, kind of the full value. So. Those are essentially the recommendations there. If you know that this is secondary content that's not critical for people who are viewing the page, maybe additional information about the product that not everyone is searching for directly, um, maybe your address, which is otherwise mentioned on your home page already, then those are the type of things that could be perfectly fine behind tabs or behind click to expand sections. Hi, John. I just wanted to also ask real quick if um, if there's an approximate number you can provide of how, uh, how much time it takes to recover from an algorithmic penalty, or in other words, how, how frequently does Google uh, refresh its index to factor in improvements which a particular site has made? Um, that's a tricky question. So essentially, we have some algorithms that, that work every time we crawl a page. And if you have a large website, then we'll crawl some of your pages daily or even several times a day. And other pages from the website we might crawl every couple of months, maybe even every half year or so. So if you make a significant change on your website and our algorithms pick that up immediately, then you'll see kind of a gradual change in the search results based on that. You won't see a change from one day to the next. Um, other algorithms are run less frequently, that they might be run every week or every month or something like that. And for those, you might see kind of a, a, a jump when they actually take place. Uh, so that's essentially, I guess, the, the main difference is there. Uh, some algorithms are pretty complicated to run. They use a lot of complicated data, and they might be run even less frequently than monthly. So it kind of depends on which algorithms you're looking at and what kind of changes you're making on your website. In general, what I'd recommend in, in a case where you suspect that your site is affected by an algorithm that takes a long time to run is just make sure that you don't get stuck in this kind of iterative battle against this algorithm. So don't try to just like fix 10%. Maybe that's good enough. Uh, but really try to make sure that you're going all the way to clean this problem up completely so that when the algorithm is run again, you don't have to go back to the drawing board and say, OK, I'll do 10% more. Maybe that will be enough. So really try to take the whole problem out of the world completely as much as possible. OK, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, do you guys also factor in social shares across various channels? Like if, if I'm getting more Facebook shares or Twitter tweets or Google Plus shares, does Google factor that into its quality score? Uh, we don't use social signals directly for the search results. Um, partially, that's because we don't have access to all of these, and partially because it's just such a big mass of signals that is really hard to kind of bundle into 
kind of a sign that this is a good website or this is a bad website because sometimes people talk a lot on social media about something that they don't like and that's kind of hard for us to differentiate in cases like that. So we don't use social signals. I think uh, I was at a conference last month with someone from Bing and they also said they don't use social signals. They have access to, I think, the Facebook data, but they don't use those social signals for normal ranking either. Thank you so much. All right. Um, is it good to promote our clients' products and their services to as many social media sites as we can? Uh, is it better to have different content to every social media website? Um, essentially, it's kind of similar to the previous question. We don't use social signals for search, um, but we do index the content on the social media sites when it's public, just like any other content that we find on the web. So if you have the same content on a social media platform as you have on your website, you're kind of competing against yourself with the same kind of content there. So I tend to do something at least slightly different on these social media sites. And most of the time, that makes sense anyway. You don't want to take a multi-page blog post and copy and paste it into Twitter, into, I don't know, 20 different tweets that are all numbered so that people can kind of click through them. Uh, you do something different on these individual social media sites to engage users, to bring, bring awareness of your product or your service to those users there, to kind of interact with those users there as well. And it's not the case that we use the social signals directly as something in search, but a lot of these things happen indirectly in that if users engage with you on Twitter or on Facebook or wherever, then maybe they'll go to your website. Maybe they'll recommend your services. Maybe they'll recommend your website directly to other people. And that's the kind of thing where indirectly it does kind of flow back into search, but uh, as a direct effect, there is no kind of use of the social signals directly in search. OK. Oh, wow, a question about authorship. Authorship markup and reputation, I know it's no longer used. Uh, does Google assign value to content depending on the author's identity, depending on the answer there? Is there an alternative markup to connect an author to content? Uh, at the moment, we don't use authorship markup at all. We don't track that information at all. I could imagine that maybe at some point that'll change, but at least at the moment there is nothing specific that you could put on your pages to say, well, this is the exact author. Um, the usual type of things that you can put on pages like your, your byline, maybe a link to your profile, I think that always makes sense for the users. Uh, it might not be something that we'd use directly in search. Though. So we, we don't use authorship anymore. Um, I wouldn't rely on like the authorship markup on doing anything specific other than being a link to your profile. Uh, John, yes. Do you think the schema.org author tag has a uh, potential to um, get uh, used uh, uh, cons considerably more in the future in this regard if uh, adoption is more widespread? I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know. I, I know we. I mean, we had a lot of this authorship information already. And if it turns out that the existing information that we had wasn't really useful for us in search, at least, and I think something significantly would need to change on the, the trailing side of where we process all of this information for us to kind of switch to schema.org markup and use that for authorship. So I imagine that's not going to happen anytime soon, but I wouldn't say it, it won't. It'll never happen. And as with other markup on schema.org, I think it always makes sense to use that markup if it's trivial for you to add, because it gives a little bit more structure to your pages. It doesn't mean that they'll rank better, but uh, it gives us a little bit more information there. And from, from that point of view, I don't see that this is a problem if you use that schema.org markup for authorship, but I also wouldn't expect it to have any kind of direct value, at least in the short term. All right, thanks. 
Uh, is there an option in Webmaster Tools to refer an M dot domain mobile site to a normal domain? There are always errors in the mobile usability report, but we have a special M dot domain for mobile. Uh, I just make sure that you're using the, the proper markup to tell us about the connection between your mobile pages and your desktop pages, that you have the rel alternate set up appropriately, that you redirect appropriately, use maybe the HTTP very header if needed. You have the rel canonical set from the mobile to the desktop pages so that we can really connect your mobile pages to your desktop pages. And then, in general, we'll pick up on that. But uh, you'll still find this information separately in Webmaster Tools. So you'd need to verify your M dot domain in Webmaster Tools. You'll see probably things like the search query data in Webmaster Tools separately, definitely the crawl data separately in Webmaster Tools. So if you have your www and the M dot site, I definitely check both of those versions to make sure you're looking at the full picture before making any big decisions around that. And this is something where if you use responsive design, you use the same URLs, you're kind of sidestepping this big problem about the different sites by just having everything in one version of your site. But uh, a lot of people already have an M dot domain, and I wouldn't just arbitrarily switch over just for that. All right. Um, we're pretty much out of time. I saw one question. I think further down somewhere here that I wanted to get to. Um, we're a hosting company with subdomains showing client sites. Uh, for example, 1.2.3-ip.example.com. Uh, changing this is not an option. Uh, these get associated with our main domain, example.com, and get us penalized. How can I tell Google to ignore those subdomains? Uh, this is a, a kind of a tricky situation because, uh, to some extent, this looks like it's all a part of the same website. So if, if at all possible, the, I think differentiating between your reverse IP lookup uh, domain host names that you have there and your main content website would be a great way to kind of separate those issues. Uh, another idea is if you're a hosting company, make sure that all of those IP addresses redirect to the actual website. So instead of just allowing the reverse lookup to actually show the content, make sure that the reverse lookup actually points to the, the hosted domain name or the, the actual domain name that's used by this website. So those are essentially the recommendations I'd have there. Um, it's Kind of tricky on our side. We try to differentiate between something like a main domain that's used there and subdomains that are used for hosting different content. Uh, we try to be as granular as possible with our algorithms there, but sometimes we we just see the domain name and we see all of this content there, and it's really hard for us to separate the good parts from the bad parts. So if you can make it easier for us to differentiate between your main separate website and all of this user-generated content that you're also hosting, then that makes it a lot easier for us to treat them separately. Uh, John, can I ask you a very quick question? Sure. I, I just wanted to know um, if links inside the HTML header should ever be uh, uh, no-followed, or whether it makes any difference at all. So you're probably talking about the, the link element, the rel alternate, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Um, no, I don't think there's even a provision for no follow there. So I, I wouldn't worry about that. They definitely don't pass pay drink. Sure. OK. Thanks, John. Sure. All right. Uh, with that, we're a bit over time. Um, is there one burning question left? Uh, can I? Sure. A uh, really quick one. Uh, I was doing, uh, I have a Canadian client, and uh, doing a, a Google query like this, uh, with a google.ro domain uh, for the brand name of the client. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I get the client, I get the knowledge graph with the map and the uh, uh, address of the client. But uh, So he's a Canadian client. And if I switch to google.ca, so from Canada, I don't get the map anymore and the address, unless I actually add the address board in the query or location. And um, I've used the structured data to uh, let Google know that's the local business, 
uh, connected to a Google Places page. Is there anything else I can do? So for Google.ca, it also shows the uh, map and address for the brand name. I don't know. If you can send me the URL, I can double check. What might be happening is that we're not picking up the geotargeting information correctly. So I double check Webmaster Tools that you have that set up. Um, maybe also double check in Webmaster Tools if you have, for example, the HTTPS version that you have the same geotargeting for the non-HTTPS version or www non www. I've seen some cases where you have one country set in the www version and a different country in the non www version, for example. And that can be really confusing. But uh, if you can post the link or if you can send it to me directly, I, I can double check to see if there's anything like that happening. OK, sure, thank you. John, we All still right. have some time? Well, kind of, I guess. <laughs> I just don't want you to miss the train. So uh, it's a, a short follow-up on an earlier question related to posts mm -hmm. uh, of comments. Uh, since there are a lot of websites which use comments, is there any uh, quantity of comments to stay on the safe side? I mean, uh, to post only first five comments or, and so on and so forth, to be able to skip the spamming part if I may say so. Um, it's not that we look at a specific number there. I, I think we mostly look at the, the overall quality of the page. And if the overall quality of the page kind of gets pulled down because of these spammy content comments, then that's something that, that could kind of worry our algorithms. Uh, if you have a big piece of content and there are like two spammy comments on the bottom, then that's something that's not going to have a big effect. But if you have a shorter piece of content and you have 100 spammy content comments on the bottom, then that's obviously going to skew everything a little bit in that direction. I understand. So, so it's yeah. about uh, quantity. Yeah, OK. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. OK. So with that, let's take a break here. I'll set up the new Hangouts, I think, for two in two weeks, just before the holidays, I can imagine. Um, so maybe I'll see you guys there. Otherwise, I wish you guys a, a great week, and see you next time. Thank you, John. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Bye, thank you.